Hello and welcome to this webinar from nmis-skills.org. Uh, today we're going to be talking about some digital well-being in general, but before we do that we'll introduce ourselves and say a little thing. Uh, so I'm Lewis Ross, I'm a learning technologist here at City of Glasgow College. Uh, to my right, as you have probably seen before, this is Joe Wilson, and hello again. And to my left is a new person, do you want to introduce yourself? Julian Hopkins, also a learning technologist. Uh, yeah, so for this one, we're doing a slightly different format. We've got three people who are doing a bit of discussion and we've got Julian in because he's one of the members of the project and he's a bit of an expert on some of these um, things we'll be talking about, which we'll highlight later. Um, so without much further ado, as I kind of say at the start of every one of these, I'll just bring up this, oh wait, first I need to do my screen share, then we'll bring up the presentation so everyone can see it. Okay, here Super. we go. So today we're really going to be talking about digital well-being and, and the learning objectives are really about that bit around understanding the safe use of technology uh, and the necessary the necessity for a uh, cyber resilience and security quite opposite today actually is there's an international <laughs> cyber security conference going on in Glasgow uh, and as part of that I think uh, I think all of our all of our systems in Glasgow are, are being tested by denial of service attacks, probably as as we speak. So I hope we get to the end of the webinar uh, this afternoon. We're also going to look at learning how to effectively apply digital technologies to learning life and work. Uh, but the focus today is very much on on well-being and the kind of things you, you need to do really to safeguard yourself and to safeguard your students. Speaking of well-being, I'm just going to quickly adjust the mic down here. You might have noticed this in many of the other webinars. This big red ball is our microphone. I'm going to make sure it's pointing at all of us, all right? Um, yeah, so what we're going to basically look today as, is at digital well-being. And it's a term you might have heard, but you might not know what it means. And one of the problems with this term is it gets a lot of different definitions. Different people mean different things when they say it. So what we're going to use is the definition from JISC, who we've used to build our frameworks around. or well, we've used their frameworks, I should say. For building our webinars. So their definition, if I can read correctly, says digital well-being, the capacity to look after personal health, safety, relationships, and work-life balance in digital settings, to act safely and responsibly in digital environments, to manage digital workload, overload, and distraction. I think that's the first time I've successfully read a sentence on these webinars. <laughs> uh, yeah, so that's what we're going to base this seminar around is all those terms. And, and again, that bit to stress, you know, it's, it's digital well-being for you as a, as a, as a teacher, eh, but it's also for your students. Eh, and I think also you need to bear in mind, because again, I think, I think particularly eh, teachers in any setting often look at their learners and, and think, well, the learners at least will know how to be safe online. And that's not always the case. Eh, there are no digital natives. Eh, we're, we're all trying to navigate the, the digital deluge and make our way through the make our way through the jungle, uh, and and really what, what we're going to cover is that bit of staying safe and staying healthy. Yeah, so that brings us nicely onto our first topic, which is health. So in this, we're not just talking about uh, physical health; we're we'll talking a little bit about mental health as well. But um, when we're doing any kind of digital stuff, some of this will seem kind of obvious to you. You might think about this all the time. But for a lot of people, these things won't be straight apparent. You won't think about it. You'll just kind of like bumble on how you've always worked. But sometimes it's worth putting a bit of thought to these. And one of the first things is physical health with how you sit and work at a computer. So at the moment, I've got quite a nice posture. I'd have my computer sat here. I'm probably a bit too far away from it, but that's just how we've got our computer set up for doing this webinar at the moment. But I'm not turning sideways onto it. This is a thing that a lot of people do. If you've got two monitors, you'll have them and you'll have one where you're constantly craning your neck. Not good for you. So just have a think about how you're actually sitting. It seems like a really simple thing to like that you just never think about, but it is worth thinking about that part of your health. Because if you are doing a lot of work at computers, you can get a bad back. It could be that you need actually a better chair, better uh, foot rests. Do ask people at your um, organization about that. Most of your health and safety officers will happily provide you with stuff to make sure that you're not getting those problems. Um, yeah, it might, it might just be wee things too, but how you how you stretch, how you use your your mouse. So you might it might actually be you're sitting perfectly all right, but it's how how you manipulate or how you use things or how you repetitively perform a task uh, can, can, can give you injuries. Uh, so just just be aware and be be aware that every organisation has got health and safety officers that'll come come and help help you position your desk, help help you organise your, your your workspace. Yeah, uh, just don't overlook it. Is the best thing to say about that. Um, similarly with screen brightness, 
don't have a really dim screen where you're going to be straining your eyes or a super bright screen in a dark room because again it'll strain your eyes pretty simple but just remember on a laptop i've got two buttons i can press that will instantly brighten and darken my screen just adjust it when you're out and about and it might be worth reminding, reminding students that too mm -hmm. uh, they, they, they might think it's a good thing to work in a darkened room before they, before they go to bed sitting and or working on a, or, on a screen but it does damage your eyesight yeah it's not good it'll give you eye strain and you'll end up with uh, like all of us oh yeah, Julian doesn't have his glasses on today but uh, <laughs> uh, another that's for reading and that's for using computers yeah <laughs> Um, yeah, I first noticed that I needed to have glasses when I started doing lots of computer work, um, when I was doing my research, well, I was staring at spreadsheets all day and I noticed towards the end of the day my eyes were going blurry. So it's worth bearing in mind, if you're getting something like that, you might actually need glasses and you just, day to day life, you're not doing that much, focusing on small things, reading lots of data, but then when you're doing that as a task most of the day, it can affect you and then getting some glasses can really help your eye health, so it really helped me out. Um, uh, kind of opposite of sight, not really, uh, noise. Um, think about your environment as well. If you're working in a very noisy office, um, sometimes just reducing levels of stress so you're not constantly being interrupted by those conversations, hearing things you can't keep yourself um, focused on tasks, which we'll be talking a bit more about later. Having some music or some light noise that you can listen to can really help. I don't know, is that something you do, Julian? You're a music fan? Yeah, sometimes, yeah. And I'm deaf as well, so, um, yeah. so I have a problem with this too much noise I can't hear people's voices and so on. Yeah. So it's important to talk to people and tell them about that as well. Exactly, yeah. So have a think about these these kind of things when you're working with people uh, or are there special provisions you can get with your computer that can help you out with this kind of stuff as well. Worth speaking to your kind of health and safety or um, your uh, support uh, people in your, your organization. They might be able to help you out with that stuff. Um, also, a quick note on mental health as well. So um, obviously there's a lot of uh, different things that can help you out with this. First thing to say with any kind of mental health, if you are feeling stressed out at work or something, do speak to your counsellors at work. That should always be your first point of call. Speak to them. It'll, they'll always be confidential services. Really worth engaging with them if you are feeling any kind of trouble mentally. Um, but one thing we do recommend, this was actually recommended by our counselling service here at the college. This is a free app called Smiling Mind. I'll just open this up. Some of you might have heard of an app called Headspace, which is a very popular kind of mindfulness meditation app. Smiling Mind is actually, it's a free one. It was developed in Australia uh, in uh, collaboration, I think, with some of the universities and colleges there. Um, and it's kind of a free-ish, free-ish. It's definitely free. It's a free version of something like um, Headspace where it'll teach you kind of um, well-being kind of, what's the word I'm looking for again? Mindfulness. Mindfulness. I, I said it earlier and I've forgotten it already. Um, clearly not practicing my mindfulness. Um, but it'll help you with those techniques and learning and doing them. Um, so it's worth going on the website, free to download. They've, they've got partnerships with a lot of colleges in um, Australia and, and also partnerships with schools that they use there. Worth checking out if you're looking for something like that to help you out. So yeah, highly recommended from our counseling team. Okay, so that's a bit about the health. What about the safety as well? The, the word that always seems to follow uh, health nowadays. Um, well, we've got a few things to talk about here. Joe, do you want to? Yeah, well, maybe, maybe I'll just start off. I mean, I think, I, I think the, the main concern is that the fear of internet security shouldn't paralyze you. It shouldn't prevent you from doing things. Uh, there are really exciting opportunities out there for, for teachers and for, for, for learners. And you really need to be that explorer and get stuck in and go, go and have a, have, have a look around. Uh, but you will be aware, and you'll, you'll see in the press, uh, that there are, there are some apps out there that, that might steal your identity or might access data that you don't wish uh, to be accessed. Uh, that there are some apps that are better suited for learning and some apps, as we'll discuss later, that are about really you and your digital footprint. And you might not want to always share all of your digital identity with your students, and your students certainly shouldn't want to share all of your digital identity with you as a, as a, as a teacher. So, so I think the first step of, of looking around is, is probably speaking to your learning technologist, uh, the, the IT department in, 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 in a college or a university, and to make sure that when you're selecting that array of apps, you're going to use with your learners that, that they've been pre-approved, that you know that they're going to be secure, uh, that you're not going to break uh, any, any of the legislation or, or breach any kind of safety uh, areas. 
Yeah, and, and some of that is also about protecting yourself because if you do have some security breaches, um, you know, some people might come and ask you questions about why did you choose this? Why, why are we using it? But don't use that to scare you, as Joe was saying, like most of the time people are going to be quite excited to try out new things. So do, but do just go and speak with a learning technologist. They'll be able to say, actually, no, that one's not brilliant, but here's an alternative for you that you can use. Um, usually people are really good with that kind of stuff. Um, other thing about safety, uh, something that I, I recommend to a lot of people, the password managers. So we're all guilty of it. We sign up for an account for something. We're like, oh, it's so hard to remember lots of passwords. I'll just put in this one I use on everything. Uh, and then what happens if that password gets uh, compromised with that email address, then people who are up to nefarious ends might be able to access that system by just you know, using a block of passwords they know are, are being compromised already. So a password manager, what it does is basically you can install it in your browser and you log into that with a very secure password. They, all these password managers have really good security. I don't think any of them have been breached in any kind of data breaches. And what it will do there is then automatically generate passwords for sites for you and store them. So you don't have to remember them. You just click one button and it'll log you in. Um, and the security on these password managers is brilliant. Like I had to reinstall my computer the other day, Windows, uh, because I'd broken it because I like trying to change things and it broke. And then to get my password manager back on, I had to go through about five different steps of proving who I was to get onto that password manager. So they're very, very secure. Really worth using one of these things. It'll make your life so much easier. You're not having to remember these complex passwords. It's doing it for you. And it's just as secure as if you were kind of coming up with a brand new one every time. Um, yeah, as Joe already, sorry, do you want to say something about password, yeah. Joe? So, so I'm, 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 some of the rest of the panel may swoon at this, but I'm, I'm sometimes reluctant to use a pa pa password a managers just because I'm worried about forgetting the password for the password <laughs> manager or, or, or not being able to access it on my phone or, 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 or a range of, of, of things. Uh, and uh, without giving away any secrets, really, uh, if you like singing songs uh, and you know quite a complicated lyric, uh, not of the, one of the most popular songs, a song that you know uh, yourself, uh, then perhaps sing that along and add letters, numbers, and symbols <laughs> Uh, in, in, in a way that, that, that would suit you, uh, and you'll find that a lot of the, the, the password crackers will find it very, very hard to, to pass that, providing it's, it's not, you know, it's not just 10 letters. You yeah. probably want something that's 15 <laughs> or 16 letters long, and perhaps all joined together, or perhaps having a few spaces in it, and it, that'll work a treat too. Uh, yeah, so also, as we've said already, be aware of the what information you're sharing. Don't just add all your personal details into every account you create. Do you actually need them in there? Leave them out if you don't. Pretty simple. Um, think about how many of these different accounts you're, you're leaving everywhere as well. Because when you put something on the internet, it doesn't really ever get deleted too easily. There's legislation that's come in recently with um, European laws about the right to be forgotten. But that doesn't apply to every single thing that you do. There are things that like cache internet pages, so they store them forever, basically. So anything that you put up on the internet is probably still there. So just think about what you're sharing. Don't put tons of personal details on the internet that you don't need people to know. Just keep that in mind. Um, yeah, and check the privacy settings on the accounts you're on. If you're on Facebook, for instance, have a look at your privacy settings. Can anyone in the world just come along and have a look at your profile? Maybe you don't want that. Maybe you want to set it so only your friends can access it. Have a look at the privacy settings of any app you install. Check what data it's accessing, what you're sharing. Uh, just get it into your routine. Just any time you start using a new service, have a look at privacy settings, get them set. Oh. I, think, I think go back and look at them too. Uh, particularly services like Facebook. Uh, Facebook actually, from time to time, changes its privacy settings without you realizing. So you have to be really careful and you have to go back sometimes and reset uh, privacy settings to, to protect perhaps images or, 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 or jokes that may be appropriate with, with a small select group of friends, but not, 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 are not appropriate for, for, for a wider audience. You need to really be aware of your digital footprint, eh, both personally and, and professionally. Yeah. Sorry. Let's add to that, in Facebook, they do have a function where you can um, see what other people can see. So there's a function there, you can say, let me see what the whole world can see on the profile. And that's a great way just to so realize that you're leaving out yeah. And a good way to see if any of your accounts have been compromised is if this web page loads. 
Um, there's this web page called Have I Been Pwned, which is an annoying term, but that's what it's called, uh, where you can basically type in an email address. So let's put in our one for the contact NMIS one. Which, which we hope is so stop. new that it certainly would have been a pwned. Yeah, so I put it in there. Good news, nothing's been compromised. So if we had been compromised, it would come down here and it would tell us a list of the websites where our um, information could have been compromised. So think about, oh, I need to go and change that password. Worth having a look at, because I bet you if you've got an email account you've been using for a long time, it's most likely been compromised somewhere. I've, I've got an email account I could key in to show you what. I, I, but let's not, well, not yeah, just share any personal data just in case. Um, but just, just for information, I don't use it anymore because so much, so, so I, I use it as an example. Ah, so. right, fair enough. Um, but yeah, so that, the links are in the slides there. You can get the slides on nmisskills-skills.org, uh, and this will be in the well-being section when they go up, uh, and you'll be able to get the slides and get access to these links if you want to have a go at that yourself. Um, okay, so we've kind of been talking a little bit there about the health and safety. So how do we manage our cybersecurity? So uh, I can talk about how I do it. I use Password Manager. Um, really kind of got ingrained into my habits that, that now using that for everything I use. So all my passwords are random combinations of letters and numbers that even I don't know. I need to go into my Password Manager to access it. Um, how do other folk manage cybersecurity? Joe, are you ready? Well, I, 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 I give you that bit about singing, sing, singing songs and, and, and string lyrics together. <laughs> uh, uh, and, and I certainly find that that works for me. And it, takes away that anxiety of, gosh, if, you know, and I have used these kind of password locker stores and I, I worry about forgetting the password for that locker store. I think the important point about that is the, um, it's the length of the password is one of the best guarantees of the security of it. So if you're using a sentence, a phrase from a, some a line of a lyric from a song or something, that's, the longer it gets, the better it is. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's basically uh, something. That yeah. Uh, one of the recommendations a lot of uh, I see now is basically a good password is three words that aren't connected. So three random words. You can even do it by looking around your office and seeing three objects and then turning that into a password could work well. Um, a lot of then sites will then force you to have a capital letter and some numbers in there. So add those in wherever you choose. And that's a good way of kind of managing your cybersecurity. But if you've got other things you want to talk about on there as well, do have a look at the forums. There'll be there's a link on nmis-skills.org. Go to the community section, then forums. You can sign up for our Google group, join the forums, and you can discuss how you manage things as well. While discussing this, please do not give anyone any details of your accounts. So do not ever tell anyone your passwords or logins. Not even the IT people at your college should or your institution should ever need to know your passwords. That is something no one should ever ask you for. Never give someone your password. So when I say send us your email and we'll send you back a secure password, don't believe me. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Don't give people details. Number one way things get compromised is through social engineering. So they're not hacking in. They're asking you questions and getting information out of you. Oh, what was your mother's maiden name? They don't need to know that. <laughs> like, so just be aware of, of if you get random calls asking you about accounts. I, th I think the other thing to be aware of is that when you use Facebook and Twitter and a range of tools, you, you might want to. You might see some useful apps or add-ins or other things that you you want you want to use that will enrich in your experience. Before you give these other apps and things permission, have a good Google round and check out and to make sure that they're as secure as you set your Facebook settings. Because yeah. you're, she you're sharing information with third-party applications, uh, and that could be where your 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 email address and your your password leaks at that point. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to move on uh, to our next topic, which is relationships. So Joe mentioned this already a bit before about thinking about um, the accounts that you're using at your work. So if you're using social media, Twitter, some places even use Facebook at their, in their kind of college or university settings, um, don't use a personal account. Create an account specifically for your work. So you're not sharing personal information with people that you don't need to be. Um, and that you're keeping it in a professional context. You're not letting things spill over, which again goes into the safeguarding side of things. Um, it's as much about safeguarding yourself as, as your pupils as well. Don't leave yourself open to allegations that aren't true because you've been a bit careless with personal information and sharing things. Just think about that when you're doing any kind of stuff with social media. Because um, a lot of people are, are very keen to just go, oh, social media is great. I'm going to use it in my lessons. 
have a think about it first before you do it. Do you think, work at council? I, I think I think that bit of, of doing it in negotiation with your with with, with your learners and your learners have to be in that space too. Uh, that just as you shouldn't be you shouldn't be sharing your personal uh, social media account with with learners. You, you should be saying to learners actually you need as learners to create a, a learning account. I, you, you don't want to be viewing their their social media accounts either. So you need to do that bit of negotiation so you you find uh, a negotiated uh, digital space that both you as a, a tutor uh, and the learner c c can work in and, and uh, can work together in. Uh, and it's about safeguarding learners too because mm -hmm. learners might not want to share their personal details with, with, with each other. They're, they're there for learning. Yeah, exactly. And it, it cuts down on the potential cyberbullying and stuff like that if it's just a work account that's being used. Um, and it gives you a bit more control and be able to do those things. And even better than that is using tools that are built into your institution. So if you've got G Suite, for example, using the tools in there and then everything's traceable and secure. Um, so also have a think about managing your professional identity. If you have, for example, I have a personal Twitter account. I don't give that uh, to any kind of work-based things because it's my personal one. It's mainly just about professional wrestling, to be honest. But there's people who I follow in there that might say dodgy stuff because, you know, it's, it's nothing dodgy, I suppose. But, you know, unprofessional things or swear words and stuff like that. So if you're kind of mixing that in with your pro uh, professional stuff as well, people look at your Twitter account, and there's a bunch of people swearing about how some wrestler's rubbish or something. Doesn't look good. So have a think about separating out your personal and your professional identities and having separate accounts for these as well. It might be worth reflecting, and I'm by no means perfect, but, but reflecting on how, how, how I do it. So I have, a, I have a Facebook account, and that Facebook account has got educational people and family friends and a whole lot of other things all, all in it. But it's really for people that I'm friendly with, that I'm close to. And that's the only people that will get access to my Facebook account. Somebody professionally wants to hook up with me. I've got a LinkedIn account. And through LinkedIn, or LinkedIn, I've got my CV there. And you can come and you can, you can be part of my LinkedIn community. I've got a Twitter account. Uh, which bizarrely isn't Joe Wilson, is Joe Carr, J-O-E-C-A-R. Uh, it's been about for a long time. I'm, I, I'm very aware that what I tweet through that is, is, is seen by everybody and anybody and is also associated with me. So I'm, I'm very careful that if I'm going to uh, share something that's just for friends, I share that through Facebook. Uh, if I'm going to post something that's, that's highly professional, I'll put it on LinkedIn. Uh, if I'm at a conference and I'm going to tweet about some observations, again professionally, then I'll use Twitter. Uh, so I've compartmentalized my, my use of, 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 of social media. I use other social platforms too, but I'm not telling you. <laughs> um, and yeah, as another point, if you've got old accounts for social media platforms you don't use anymore, just go and delete them. Just keeps you safe. Um, less chance of data being compromised. Uh, people aren't going to stumble across old things you did and think, you know, you're listed as currently, I'm really interested in working in the field of uh, astrophysics. And then suddenly you're not interested anymore. And then you're getting all these headhunting emails saying, do you want to come and do our job in astrophysics? Um, just delete that stuff if you don't need it anymore. Um, just the kind of, the, our main message with all this stuff is just try and be mindful about how you use these things. Just have a think about it, privacy settings. Old accounts, all this kind of stuff. And sometimes, again, delete old accounts. Go in. If you're going to shut an account, go and make sure you get all your data as much as you can back, back out and off. Don't think just because you've you've switched it off or you've done that it will disappear. Sometimes you really have to go in and, uh, and strip out the, the data to make sure that nobody else can, can find it. Yeah. So on to our next thing. So, Julian, this is kind of your expert, this expertise. Yeah, really, you want to talk about this? Just like Joel was saying earlier, and he's talking about the information deluge, and, and one of the key problems people have with digital literacy is, is managing all the information. And, and basically, managing information is important. A lot of jobs nowadays is about gathering and processing information. And and we've just got a couple of quotes here. McLuhan's a well-famous uh, media theorist. You might have heard of the medium is the message. It comes from him. And um, he talks about a uh, man as a woman as information gatherer basically that's how you can make money that's how you get a job nowadays a lot of the time is using information in different ways and 
Boyd also comes along later to talk about the psychological equivalent of obesity. And the issue here is that um, obesity is, is a significant problem in, in richer countries. And what it means is people are eating too much, but what it, kind of food they're eating is food that's loaded in salt and sugar and fat. And the thing is we're hardwired to eat that kind of food. It's very difficult to resist it. And so what people have to do nowadays in countries like that where they're fortunate enough to get too much food, is they have to train themselves not to eat all that food which is available. Because evolutionary, in an evolutionary sense, we should be eating all that food whenever you get hold of it. And the thing is we're humans, we like, and as social beings, we also need to pay attention to others. Everywhere you work, and when you're with people, you want to know what's happening. You want to know who's up, who's down, why somebody is successful, what's happening over there. And so, and what's happening, and this is why we've got conditioning here, and the, the jukeboxes here, the, the fruit machines, is um, basically what's happening is social media, and one of the reasons they're so successful is because they feed into that need we have to know about what's happening around us. Who, who was, what are people doing? And they use colors like red. They use different ways of attracting our attention all the time. So we have to train ourselves. And this is Dana Boyd. She's a researcher who's working with Microsoft now. And um, basically, she says that we have to also train our brains not to pay attention to everything. And that's one of the key things is so much stuff is happening. And you feel like you have to know what is happening all the time. And just have to say, actually, I don't. And that's what this, this, uh, this is about here. So I was just thinking of that, your attention, talking about mindfulness as well as one of the same issue is like, how can I just focus on what I'm doing now, work on what I'm doing and not, not worry about something happening on social media. Mm -hmm. so I think there's some, some evidence too that particularly in Silicon Valley, some, some, of the, some of the big Silicon Valley gurus yeah. are starting to send their kids mm -hmm. to begin with uh, to schools where there's no technology. Uh, and that's because they think actually it's better for the learner's imagination uh, yes. to begin with. But obviously it's moving that, that distraction, that impulse of continually checking your Facebook or your Twitter profile or whatever, uh, what, what you're at while you're at school. Yeah. yeah, I think there's a link that we put a link here. There's, one, there's an ethicist, he was the Google ethicist, and he quit Google and now he's, he's actively warning people about these problems. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we've, we've come up with a, a few things to kind of help you manage this kind of work-life balance of like constantly being deluged by this digital torrent. Uh, I think it's a very good analogy for it. Um, so uh, do you want to talk about this one first? Yeah, uh, so this is something to, I use myself. Uh, and um, open up the, the I software. guess like many people, uh, many people out there, I've you know, been working and suddenly you think, oh, I'm going to check on Facebook. And before you know it, an hour is gone into the pit black hole of Facebook. <laughs> and this is a very simple tool which you can have in your browser. And what it does is you can give yourself, say for every 10 minutes, I, my browser's, I'm on my computer, my browser's open, I can get one minute on my favorite website. So right now, if I wanted to go, if I could click right now, it's blocked, I can get one minute, it will take us to facebook.com. And that's because we have one minute allowed. And after one minute, it will block it and then we stop. So you can work for an hour or two and then get a little break because it's important to remember that it's okay to use social media. It's okay to go on Twitter. Nobody's saying don't do this stuff. It's just about, you know, focusing and using it in a way which is good for your work-life balance, for your own health and well-being. Yeah, just kind of managing that, that kind of workload really more than anything. Um, and similarly, there's another one. I'll just actually take us to this thing. Uh, another one that you've used in the past. Julian, yeah, so was that's that, yeah. similar. This one, I, I like the one where you just, you, you win your time, but this is similar. This one, you can just set up certain websites at certain times. So you could say, I don't allow myself to look at Facebook between nine and 12, give myself some time at lunchtime, block myself until the end of the day, things like that. So you can just set up a whole bunch of websites. You can have them in different categories and the timing and everything. And it's just a way of organizing. And they make it difficult for you to change it. Yeah. They have sort of ways that you can always obviously unblock it if you want to, but they sort of have various steps you have to do and you have to produce a long, long password and mm -hmm. stuff like that. Yeah, so um, the, there's also, if you're using YouTube a lot, you might be using it for work, uh, watching tons of videos. Um, so sitting there for hours and hours staring at YouTube, um, not great for you, you want to get up and get some exercise. YouTube actually has a built-in take a break reminder. This is a little link that'll just take you to the documents how to use it. So basically you can set it so after so many minutes, uh, say 30 minutes, 
it'll pause the video and it'll flash up a little thing saying, hey, you should take a break, get out for a couple of minutes, have a walk around, then go and sit back down again. So a lot of services have these kind of tools built in now. So it's worth having a look at them if you are finding you're sitting there, you know, hunched over the computer for four hours, not doing anything. Just having those little reminders can really help. And while we're speaking of reminders, that's where Pomodoro comes in. Are you the expert on this, Joe? No, I'm actually not. No? Really okay. Um, I, I know a little bit about it, so I can talk about it. So Pomodoro, it means tomato in Italian. Um, and the reason for that is because it was invented by a guy who was looking for a way of managing his work and, and taking breaks. And he had this tomato oven timer type thing, one of those kitchen timers where you turn it around and it ticks around and dings at the end. So he called it tomato because he had a tomato shape, one of these. And the idea is that you use a timer, you wind it to 25 minutes, and after 25 minutes, you take a five minute break. And you do that for every one of your tasks. There's also this idea in it as well of um, before you start a task, you have to think about what needs to get done, you prioritize them, and then you start on a task. And that 25 minutes is the unit of time. So after 25 minutes, you move on to a different thing. So even if you haven't got it finished, you park it for the moment, move on to a different thing. Um, so it's worth looking that up. Uh, I'm not an exact expert on it. Have you ever used Pomodoro? I've used it a lot. I mean, I had the timer. I used to do that. And, uh, and the advantage about it is you'll be working away, and sometimes you feel like taking a break, and then you're like, oh, I've just got five minutes to go. Uh, I might as well just continue doing it. And then you take a break. Ideally, it's a good idea is to stand up and walk around and move your eyes around, not around you know, where you already are, to stop your eyes getting tired and so on. I, th I, th I think the trick is we're, we're, we're chatting about, and obviously all, all, all these tools uh, are useful for us as, as, as teachers, uh, but they're actually all, all the tools that you really need to show your learners, because uh, mm -hmm. these are the kind of things that learners can get very easily distracted and very easily overtaken uh, by, by, by other, other distractions. So things like Pomodoro or the, the, the YouTube tool or Leech Block or, or Morphine, are all good things to show learners so that they focus on the, the learning you want them to do. Yeah, and uh, I've got a note here of one note, which is that what I use, but because of the uh, problems with IT recently with this uh, attack, uh, it's not worked too well. Um, but what it is, it's basically a note-taking software. So it's similar to, to Google Keep and, and Google Tasks, which we've talked about before. And what I use that for is keeping a task list. So I can put my tasks in, I can tap them across, so I've got them kind of tiered, and I can prioritize, move things around. So instead of having an email inbox that's full of 500 emails waiting for me to do stuff, I look at the emails, go, okay, is that something I need to action something from it on? Right, okay, it goes into my task list. And then I can move them around. And that, that's how I manage things. It really worked well for me um, because then I can look at priorities. I can look at how much I've done. And it's really satisfying taking one of those things off when, you, when you've done it. It gives you a little kind of, yes, I've achieved something today. And it also allows you to see that, you know, when you're feeling really overworked and stuff, you can prioritize, you can see where things are, um, you can set yourself deadlines as well. It's just a nice way of working. Yeah, yeah I use a variety of these list uh, software uh, tools as well, and they are, they are really, it is really satisfactory when you can when you can cross things off your list that you've achieved things. Mm. Well, talking about health and well-being, water, remember to keep hydrated. Um, okay, so on to the next part of our work-life balance, notifications. So um, we've all got phones. I've got mine in my pocket here. We usually turn these on to airplane mode when we're um, presenting these things. So we don't get lots of notifications because one of the problems with modern life is your phone is constantly binging at you. You've got an email, you've got um, some texts, this WhatsApp group has messaged you. This game is telling you that you know you should play it again. How to think about your notifications. How many of those do you actually need to be getting? So for the one of that game, you don't need to be reminded to play a game, especially when you're kind of trying to be productive. So go into the notification settings for your phone. I've got a couple of links on the slides here. Have a look at them in your own time um, on how to manage these for Android and iOS. Go into those notification settings and just turn off the ones you don't need. Just straight turn them off, especially the game ones. You don't need to be pinged about that stuff because that's how they're trying to get you with the kind of Skinner box and stuff that Julian was talking about is they're trying to constantly make you think that you need to do something and you get that little dopamine reward when you engage with it. Oh yeah, brilliant. I feel like I was talking about checking off things on the list. They're trying to do that, but with their games and stuff. So just turn them off, you don't need them. Um, and in those settings as well, I know on Android, they're very good. There's a lot of fine grain control. So for my emails, for example, I can tell it, don't tell me notifications for things that aren't important. Don't give me notifications within this time frame. And a lot of the ones as well, 
they'll, you'll be able to say, okay, uh, I'm on a take a break mode, tap this on, it's not gonna give you any notifications for the next hour. Very good if you've got a meeting where you need to pay attention to someone else um, and politeness as well. <laughs> yeah, and, I mean, and for lots of things when you wanna get down to work, airplane mode, these kind of modes that actually just, just take, you, take you off the network for a wee while, uh, really useful. Uh, and, and that's what they're there for. So, so, so use them, give yourself some me time away from your mobile device or with your mobile device switched off or, or, or turned down so you can focus on tasks. Yeah, and uh, one of the things as well to bear in mind is like, just because you got a notification doesn't mean you have to deal with it now. Start trying to train yourself when you hear your phone bing, don't pick it up instantly, just leave it there for five minutes. Because there is this constant demand in modern life that because you can be available all the time, you need to be available all the time. That's a kind of a little trap that you can fall into. Um, just because it's there binging doesn't mean you have to respond to it. You're your own person. <laughs> you can manage things however you want. If you do feel like that you, there's something very important coming in, fine, pick it up, have a look at it. But try and train yourself not to. And what we actually have is an interesting exercise. I'll come back to that because I think this is a good thing to talk about now uh, and because we're running slightly low on time. But uh, Julian, do you want to talk yeah, about this? Yeah, this? this is something you can take with yourself. You could, yeah. For example, the, the whole point of NMIS skills is that we're producing material which you can use in your own classroom. You could take this presentation, adapt it as you want. And this is an activity you could do with the learners. You could tell them at the beginning of the class, you say, okay, you do need to prepare like a little worksheet for them, just observation, something like, how am I feeling? A few little pointers. Just have that ready in advance so it's easy to hand out and they know what to do with it. And basically you tell them, you say, okay, you're going to turn off your phone for 30 minutes or put it in airplane mode. And then it's important here, you say, after that, you get five minutes to catch up because there has been some research that shows that students, if they're asked to turn off the phone, they start feeling really worried that they're not going to, they're going to miss out on something. So just tell them, you 30 minutes off after that, you're going to have five minutes, open minutes, you do what you want, check in everything. And then... Once you, you deliver your, for your 30 minutes, you deliver your presentation, and at the end, you would ask them to record the thoughts, and then you could have a discussion with them. And how did it feel? Was anything, did you actually miss anything important in that last half hour? How many times did you feel your body like sort of wanting to go for the phone, put your hand in your pocket? Mm -hmm. And then, and those are ways, once again, to help people think about what they're doing and how they may be yeah. conditioned to certain things and just getting a bit of control over their own activity and you could just integrate that into a class like this yeah it's really good to start to think about that kind of mindful way of thinking like you're saying of like actually i do do these things or just because a lot of time you're just doing things instinctively you're not thinking about those processes you're going through really cool activity i actually quite want to give that a try i think sure. i think i think the other thing and it's about your own sort of time management you know consciously perhaps set up a time in the day when you do do emails and you read emails and you respond to things Actually, that's the time in the day that you do that. The rest of the day, you're doing, you're doing other tasks and things. You might even set up a, a sort of out of office or, or an automatic reply to people saying that you only, you only check emails once every two days and, and you'll come back. So, so, so people don't pressurize you for, I send you an email, here's the response, because they shouldn't be doing that. They shouldn't be doing that either. People need time to reflect uh, before you reply to things. Yeah, so I'll just quickly, because we're in the last minute, I'll say, if you jump on the forums, um, what we'd like to discuss is what apps and techniques do you use to increase your productivity? We'd like to hear what you're doing out there. You might just have little techniques you want to share with people, get some tips and tricks. Um, so go onto the forums to discuss that on nms-skills.org. So that brings us to the end of the webinar for today. Hopefully you've learned something useful there. Uh, quite a lot of tips that we've bar barraged at you there, because <laughs> there's a lot to go through with a topic like this. It can be quite broad. Um, but do have a watch it again on YouTube. You can get on our YouTube channel, NMIS Skills. Uh, and here is our credits for today of everything that we've used in the slide. And we will see you in the next webinar. Okay. Yeah. But by now, and also check out the links on the website. There's a whole lot of other tools there. Cheers. Bye-bye.